All right, welcome everybody uh, to this, our fourth and final Spring 22 Field of Vision Lecture Series, sponsored by the Department of Visualization in the College of Architecture. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to also invite you to stay after today's talk by the Malachan to um, participate in our closing reception, have a little uh, bite and um, chat about today's lecture and the other lectures that we've seen before. Um, I'm now going to hand the microphone off to Courtney Darren to give an introduction for our speaker. Thanks. I'm very excited to introduce Memo Austin today. He's a multidisciplinary artist, experimental filmmaker, musician, and computer scientist from Istanbul, Turkey. He works with emerging technologies and computation as a medium to create images sounds, films, large-scale responsive installations and performances. He holds a PhD in artificial intelligence and expressive human-machine interaction from Goldsmiths University of London and is currently assistant professor of computational and new media art at the University of California at San Diego. And we're very excited, Memo, to hear what you have to share with us about your work in process today. Well, pass it. Pass the mic. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Courtney, for the introduction, um, and thank you all. Uh, is my voice coming through all right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you all for joining me in this hybrid uh, modality as we uh, approach, well, enter, and well in year three of the pandemic, and I'm once again speaking to a camera, as, I, as we all have done millions of times over these past few years. Um, so today um, I will talk mostly about my recent work uh, spanning the kind of last few years and this will cover topics such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, perception, cognition and related artistic exploits. Uh, but before I do that, um, so before I dig deep into a few projects, I want to give an overview of what I've been doing um, and what kind of where I come from. So I've just turned off the music, that, that's not a bug. Um, so I'm a computational artist and this is a kind of selection of work spanning the last 15 years or so. Um, and my biggest inspiration, I like to say, is nature and the nature of nature. Uh, this spans from the nuclear fusion in the heart of the sun to the photosynthesizing organisms that fuel all of life on the surface of Earth, to the incredibly complex hyperobjects that we call human civilization and culture. And what I do on a practical level, my craft, so to speak, is that I write software. So every bit of work, everything you're seeing here is ultimately the output of a piece of custom software that I've written to do specifically the task that I want it to do. And one of the things that I've always been very interested in is exploring interactive real-time computational systems to enhance artistic creative expression. Here, the emphasis is on real-time and interactive. In other words, these are systems that enable a person to expressively create, manipulate, and perform images and sounds in real-time and with meaningful human control. I think of this as analogous to playing a musical instrument where there's an immediate creative feedback loop between the user and the system. In fact, from a cybernetics or control systems theory point of view, we can liken this to a closed loop with continuous control, but with emphasis on creative expression. And this is something I've been exploring for many, many years with various different computational approaches. And I gradually moved into using machine learning about a decade ago, and I ended up getting a PhD in what I call deep visual instruments, real-time, continuous, meaningful human control over deep neural networks for creative expression. And some of my work 
also falls into the field known as expanded animation, or I like to think of it as expanded animation. This is breaking away from a 2D screen, um, exploring ways of augmenting and hacking physical space. In 2011, I founded a studio called Marichma Laser Feast, or MLF for short. And a lot of the work that I made in particular around 2011 to 2014 was heavily invested in this space, in particular within a commercial context. Uh, but I left MLF in 2014 to pursue different goals and I ended up doing a PhD in, in deep learning. So today I'd like to talk about some of these more recent works and mostly about the high level conceptual motivations behind them. So I had this realization um, a few years ago, uh, quite a few years ago in 2015, judging by the timestamp of this tweet, that all of my work was about waves or God. And somehow quantum mechanics unifies the two. Now, I don't know what I was on when I said that, but looking back, I think um, when I use the term waves, I think I meant the patterns in nature which we humans have managed within our limited cognitive abilities to collectively recognize, decipher, and formalize into equations and theories. Often that we somehow even find elegant or beautiful, whatever that may mean. And when I use the term God, I think I meant those mysterious aspects of nature, which we have yet to understand, and the lengths that we will go to, stories we will tell to try and make sense of the world. And with the term quantum mechanics, I think I meant the fringes of human knowledge, which we empirically know to be quite accurate and can understand the language of mathematics. However, we're not yet able to comprehend what it actually means in the broader human level. So this is where I find myself oscillating around the most. Broadly speaking, I think of it as the intersections of science and spirituality, but more specifically, it's the collisions between nature, science, technology, ethics, ritual, tradition, and religion. Can you see my screen, by the way? Okay, because the, the rectangles disappeared, but anyway. So that was a wave, of course, an oceanic wave, something I'm very, um, very inspired by. And this is also a wave. Uh, it's a sound wave, I can tell you that. But I would be very impressed um, if anybody can look at this and identify what it is a sound wave of. This is a different representation of the same signal uh, transformed into the frequency domain using a Fourier transform. It's a spectrogram. Again, I'd be very impressed if anybody could tell what this is a spectrogram of just by looking at it. Um, the harmonics are visible here, these kind of these lines. So that gives a clue, but it's still impossible to an untrained eye to determine what this is just by looking at it. another representation of the same signal, uh, which I hope you can hear, as pressure waves in the air. So when we listen to this, it becomes very obvious what this is. This is a piano, I'm turning it down now, uh, playing a single note. And if you have a particularly well-trained ear, you might even recognize this note to be a standard pitch A4, 440 hertz with a bit of background noise that I threw into confusion. And what's happening here is really quite remarkable. There's so much information to begin with, and these pressure waves propagate through the air and they vibrate the eardrum. And our cochlea, already in the inner ear, mechanically transforms this time series signal into the frequency domain, into a representation similar to that of a spectrogram. And then those signals propagate through the auditory cortex and the dominant frequencies are identified and analyzed. And then the conscious you 
is unaware of all of this, but from the ratios of the dominant frequencies and amplitudes, it is identified and reported to the conscious field that this is indeed a piano playing a single note. It's not playing a chord, it's not a violin playing that same note, and it's definitely not a dog or an ambulance. All of this complex information is analyzed, filtered, reduced, and all that you consciously perceive and know is that this is a piano playing a single note. And this is essentially what I'm interested in. How do we take what may initially look like random noise, but ultimately it turns out to have some kind of structure? How do we navigate that noise and reduce these incredibly complex signals down to very little, but very concise, high level meta information? And now this is what we're trying to teach machines to do as well. So the, the work that I just showed is from an ongoing series of work that I started in 2011 called Simple Harmonic Motion. And it's an investigation into oscillations and the emergence of complex patterns and rhythms through the interaction of very simple oscillatory behavior. It's inspired by many phenomena in the natural world from very simple physical systems such as pendulums to more complex biological systems and beyond. And visually and sonically, it's very inspired by the likes of John Whitney, Norman McLaren, George Ligeti, Terry Riley, and of course, Steve Reich's many phasing pieces. And I made many, many incarnations of this particular work over the years. Um, some kind of relatively straightforward audiovisual projections, some very immersive installations, kind of more sculptural and compositional approaches as well, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, I did a live performance with 16 drummers and quite a large installation and performance with 80 robotic spotlights. Yeah, at a palace of all places, um, Blenheim Palace, in fact. And the basic premise of this whole series is that you look at this system and you see a lot of moving parts. And at first glance, it might seem quite complicated. But actually, this is such an incredibly simple system. It's just one very simple tool. And yet, from that one simple tool, all of this really complex behavior emerges. So the idea of complexity emerging from simplicity, um, I'm not the only one to find this fascinating. It's very, very well established here in the research, uh, both scientifically and artistically, and arguably all the natural world based on this principle that all the emergent behavior that we see in biology and physics. But a key part of this work is that when you look at it long enough, you start to see beyond that complexity and you start to recognize the patterns, you start reducing it. And then the system starts appearing quite simply. This is what you see when you look straight up at the sky. Um, this is a key part of the experience of this particular installation, using the sky and the clouds as, as a screen. As you spend more time with this system, uh, you start to see beyond the complexity and you start recognizing patterns and pieces. Interestingly, no, I'm going to you. Okay. oh, yeah. Just to let you know that when the sound gets louder on your videos, it starts to interfere with our ability to hear. Oh, okay, so the, the music volume is too loud. Thanks for letting me know. Thank you. So, um, one second, whoops. If I talk now, in fact, I'll just turn it off. You don't need to hear it uh, at this point. Okay. So I was saying, this is what you see and hear when you look straight up at the sky. And this is a key part of the experience of this particular installation, uh, using the sky, the clouds as a screen. So as you spend more time with the system, uh, you start to see beyond the complexity and you start recognizing patterns and you start reducing it. But interestingly, the rules and structure that you may start to decode 
may not be the simple rules that I coded in that's driving it. But you see a whole new set of higher level simple patterns which emerge out of the complexity, which had emerged out of that first simple rule. So this is again your brain watching, learning, and reducing a complicated system down to a much simpler representation, desperately trying to find structure to compress and understand. And this is how all of human knowledge works, from the fundamental laws of physics to chemistry, biology, neuroscience, psychology, sociology, anthropology, economy, politics, all multiple layers of abstraction. And the most recent in this series is called The Os awesome Machinery of Nature, We Are All Connected. It was commissioned in 2021 by the Royal Northern College of Music in the UK, um, who had also commissioned my drumming performance. This is a, an abstract film, an experimental simulation and computational composition that celebrates the interconnectedness of all living and non-living things across many scales of time and space from the interactions of subatomic particles and oscillations in quantum fields that permeate space-time, to the formation of matter and stars, to the emergence and evolution of life from inanimate matter and the cosmic webs that connect us all. The full animation is seven minutes long. I just like to play a few short excerpts from it, which should hopefully have music or sound. You get the idea. Um, going a bit deeper into this theme, um, I want to go back all the way to July 2015. Uh, some of you might remember Deep Dream, some of you might not. Uh, this was some research by uh, engineers at Google who dropped Deep Dream upon us in July 2015. And I know everyone hates Deep Dream, um, but I really, really love it. Uh, but it's not the aesthetics that I love of Deep Dream, rather it's the poetry of what's happening inside the algorithm. So to familiarize those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is an artificial neural network which has been trained to classify or recognize images. And what the Deep Dream algorithm does is when presented with a new image, such as my face, that it doesn't recognize, instead of trying to classify that image, what the Deep Dream algorithm does is it runs the network backwards in a way to modify the image 
such that it maximizes the ampli it amplifies um, the activation of certain neurons or layers in the neural network. In other words, it's trying to say, modify the input image so that it looks most like what you think it is within these neurons. So this is kind of a bit analogous um, loosely to you looking at a cloud and you think you see a rabbit and then you draw the rabbits that you think you see. So, and then you look at what you drew and you see another rabbit and then you draw what you see and you just basically maximize and amplify this over and over again. So that in itself, I think, is interesting as a metaphor for maybe confirmation bias and things like that. But there's even more to Deep Dream that I find really fascinating because people look at these images and they say, oh, look, there's a puppy slug or a bird lizard. But actually, there's no such thing as puppy slugs or bird lizards. This is just noise with a particular distribution such that when you look at it, you can't help but project what you know onto it. There are certain patterns in the original image that cause certain neurons in the artificial neural network to fire. And then Deep Dream amplifies those activations by modifying the image. And then we look at the output images. And then there's activity in our brain that responds to those features. And we amplify those in our imaginations as well. So in a way, we complete that recognition process. We are like, an, this is like an entanglement. There's a duet between a biological and an artificial neural network on a quest for making meaning. And this is something that I'm really interested in. And that is using machines that learn to reflect on how we make sense of the world and using machine bias to reflect on our own self-affirming cognitive biases. Because you can put this into an artificial neural network, pure random white noise, and this is typically what we do basically. And then this goes on a long journey through multiple dimensions and transformations in space and time, because that is quite literally what a deep neural network is. And it produces this. It's a kind of more structured noise with a very particular distribution. And we are machines that yearn structure. It's, it's who we are, it's what we've always done. We look for patterns and we find them and then we project what we know onto them and we invent stories and then we believe those stories. This is how we deal with uncertainty. It's how we connect with each other and form and communities. We invent rituals, which I think of as algorithms for the body and mind to transform our mental and emotional state to otherwise unattainable modes of being. We see things not as they are, but as we are. Everything that you see or read or hear, and even these sentences that I'm saying right now, you're trying to make sense of by relating to your own past experiences filtered by your prior beliefs and knowledge. And actually, I have no idea what any of what I'm saying mean to any of you. It's impossible for me to see the world through your eyes and feel what you feel without having read everything you've read, seen everything you've seen, and lived everything you've lived. Empathy and compassion is much harder than you might think. And that makes it all the more valuable and crucial. This is from a series of work called Learning to See. Um, it's an artificial neural network running real-time inference on a live camera input. And there's a few themes behind this work. On a practical level, it's exploring expressive human-machine interaction, um, tying into the themes I was talking about at the start of my presentation, uh, in particular, how investigating how we can use deep learning um, but with real time, meaningful human control. And, but there are also high level motivations behind this work. So this is a network which has seen nothing but thousands of images of waves or flowers. And now when it looks upon the world and it sees my desk and my hands, it tries to make sense of what it's seeing in context of what it's seen before. 
but it can only see through the filter of what it already knows, just like us, because we too see things not as they are, but as we are. So as well as a number of videos, this work also exists as an installation. Um, there's a plinth with a bunch of junk on it, some broken cables, dirty rags, and you can spend a few seconds playing with them for a quick bit of fun. Or if you're like me, you can spend hours meticulously crafting your perfect bouquet um, or shaping the perfect waves or ocean scene. So I trained a number of models uh, inspired by the fundamental elements of nature. Flowers represents earth, ocean is water, of course, there's fire, um, clouds, represents air or wind and the fifth element which is beyond our planet the ether the void the cosmos and this was a neural network trained on thousands of images from the hubble space telescope so that deep dream video i showed at the start was 2015 um, i made a kind of sequel to it uh, this I made last year, 2021, um, while I was in lockdown in Turkey. Um, and it's quite incredible how quickly technology has progressed. This is not using Deep Dream, it's using a technique called clip guided image generation um, with VQGAN in particular. It's in many ways, it has its roots, I would say, in Deep Dream, kind of technically. Um, this I made, I think, around May or April, May, June, 2021, um, so about a year ago. And it's incredible, even since then, how far the technology has come. So I'll just play this now. I hope you can understand the audio of this because there's speech in it. to think of a cybernetic network where mammals and computers live together in mutually programming harmony like pure water touching clear sky. I like to think of a cybernetic forest filled with pines and electronics where deers draw peacefully past computers as if they were flowers with spinning blossoms. I like to think of a cybernetic ecology when we are free of our labors and joined back to nature, return to our mammal brothers and sisters. So um, that was uh, me reading a poem, uh, All, Watched Over by, All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace by Richard Brotigan from 1960 something, I should have written that down. Um, and apart from the theme of the poem, obviously, uh, which I thought was very fitting, again, this was an exploration into meaningful human control um, over, in this particular case, over narrative. Um, that's kind of been a really big part of my research is again, how can I, as the artist, as the author, exercise some level of control over the meaning of what's um, coming out? I would like to go back to um, and really dig deeper into that theme I was talking about, that we see things not as they are, but as we are. Uh, that was the motivation behind this work called Fight 
again from 2017, a same as learning to see. Uh, this work is not about AI or machine learning at all, but rather about perception and cognition and human bias and the subjective experience. It uses virtual reality technology, uh, but the piece itself is about as non-VR as it, it one can get, I think, and I'll explain why shortly. Ultimately, it's a work about empathy, but not empathy as in VR is the ultimate empathy machine, which is the kind of more dominant narrative around VR, but rather about the impossibility of empathy. Our eyes are often likened to cameras, as if light falls on the retina, forms an image, and then that image gets sent to the brain for further processing. Um, but that's not how seeing happens at all. Um, since the days of the ancient Greeks, it was believed that we actually shot rays out of our eyes. And upon those rays hitting objects, that's how we could see. Even people as smart as Plato believed that the eye contained such fire that has the property not of burning, but of yielding a gentle light. And when it strikes upon any object it encounters outside, it passes on the motions of anything it comes in contact with throughout the whole body to the soul and thus causes the sensation we call seeing. People such as Euclid, Ptolemy, and many other great thinkers for centuries elaborated on this idea known as the extra mission theory of vision. Um, and I find this quite a beautiful theory. Um, of course, they were wrong. Uh, even back then, many, many centuries before Newton, the Arab mathematician, astronomer, and pioneer of optics, Ibn al-Haytam, and many others, uh, believed in an intromission theory of vision, that our eyes didn't emit light, but rather light or other kind of particles bounced or came off objects and entered the eye. And that's how we saw. However, I still like the extra mission theory because it does capture and underline one aspect of vision that sometimes gets forgotten in modern interpretations and something that I really wanted to emphasize, and that is seeing is an active process. Um, there's so much processing happen, happens in the eye itself. The only part of the retina, which is actually really full color and high resolution is the fovea, which has only two degrees field of view. So if I hold my arm out at full length, the fovea can see just about two thumbnails wide. Everything outside of this is much lower resolution and mostly black and white. Yet my conscious experience of vision is that I have this clear picture covering an enor enormous window greater than 180 degrees. And that's because several times a second, the brain sends messages to the eye muscles to make these quick jerky movements known as saccades. And at the end of each saccade, the eye pauses and it fixates momentarily on a feature in the scene and it very quickly adjusts exposure and focus. And the brain integrates the current information it has about the scene with the movement of the eyes and the head and the body and combines that with everything that it already thinks it knows and expects about the scene. And it constructs this mental image. And we know this uh, mostly through the Russian scientist Alfred Yarbus in his seminal research in the 50s and 60s on eye tracking and vision using this, what appears to be a torture device. And he even found that the meaning that we try to extract from a scene affects the way that our eyes scan it. For example, in a very famous study, he used the painting, An Unexpected Visitor, and he asked people questions such as, how old are the people in the painting? How long has the visitor been, been away? What were the people doing before he came in, etc.? And the questions he asked affected the way people's eyes unconsciously scanned the scene. So our eyes are continually unconsciously scanning the world. A lot of this information doesn't make it to our conscious awareness. Instead, the information is processed and integrated to provide a single coherent model of the world, analogous to a piano playing a note as opposed to the individual data points of that single. 
So even though structurally there are similarities between our eyes and a camera, such as a lens that can focus the lights and a variable aperture that can adjust exposure, the philosopher Alvanoe likens the act of seeing with our eyes far more similar to the act of seeing with one's hands that a visually impaired person might do um, as opposed to a camera. And the final thing I'd like to talk about with regards to this project is binocular rivalry, which is a, quite an extreme and fascinating phenomenon that demonstrates a lot of these issues regarding our senses and conscious awareness. So under normal circumstances, your two eyes usually receive information about the 3D world that's in front of them from slightly different viewpoints. And the brain integrates these two signals along with lots of other information like parallax and size estimation, et cetera, to produce a single cohesive spatial model of the scene in our mind. However, if each eye is presented with dissimilar monocular images, i.e. these images which are radically different, for example, red and black vertical lines to the left eye and blue and black horizontal lines to the right eye, then the brain cannot integrate these conflicting signals into a coherent vision. So what then do we see in our conscious mind? One might expect that you see a blend of the two, but that's not what happens. These rival images fight for perceptual conscious awareness. The conscious mind sees only one of the two images, particularly in the foveal vision, and it randomly flips between them every few seconds. And in your peripheral vision, you see these swirly cloudy masks. And one thing that's really fascinating is, even if the images being presented to you are completely static, in your mind's eye, in your conscious awareness, you see animated patchy swipes and transitions between the two images. And you don't really have control over this. Um, there are studies that say with meditation, um, that's why the cover image, and then that's why I had that cover image, uh, Tibetan Buddhist monks apparently can fully control this after they meditate. So that, so it's, it's, there's so many fascinating studies um, around this. I could talk about just this for hours, uh, but I won't. Uh, but the relevance to my work and this particular project here is that one thing that I find really fascinating is what you see in your mind and the way it moves depends on your physiology. And it's impossible for me to see or even begin to understand what it is you see. And it's kind of practically impossible for you to communicate to me what it is that you're seeing when you're presented with this stimulus. So to quickly summarize, what we perceive to be real, what we see is a reconstruction in our minds, a simplified model of the world limited by our biology and physiology. Perception, including vision, is an active process. It requires action and integration. The actions that we take affects the reality and the meaning that we construct in our mind. And perhaps most importantly, even when presented with the same information, the same images, everybody will experience something unique and personal, which nobody else can see or maybe even understand. And I'm interested in these ideas at a low level regarding our senses, particularly vision, but also conceptually at a higher level regarding how we make meaning and what we consider to be truth and our biases and prejudices and how we interact with each other as a result of this and its impact on society and politics, especially it seems right now as our societies become more torn than ever. Um, and these gaping wounds seem to me to be partially the result of our clear inability and refusal to see the world from other people's perspectives. So fight, the word fight as a title has many meanings in this context, both from the signals fighting in our minds, um, but also the fights that arise as a part of it. So it's a VR experience, um, as I mentioned. Um, I presented like this as an installation, really. Uh, the setting is 
you know, part of the experience so that when you enter the room, you see a rather homely, safe and welcoming environment um, with maybe a slight twist of an eerie discomfort um, and hopefully hinting that one is about to go on some kind of spiritual journey of self-discovery. Uh, it's a 10 minute kind of linear experience and it goes through many different um, turn the sound off many different kind of modes uh, rivalry comes in and out so there are times at this at this point for example it's about halfway through you can look around and wherever you look the room deforms um, and at this point i'll just pause it uh, there is no rivalry so it feels like you are physically inside a room and the walls are you know, five meters or 15 feet away from you. That, that's what it feels like because you have the depth perception. But then slowly rivalry comes in. And as rivalry comes in, the, as the signals start to differ, the rivalry phenomena starts to kick in. And then you lose all sense of depth perception. And then you start seeing these really, um, you know, swiping animations in your mind where it's, it's swiping between, you know, the, the blue and the yellow and, and the colors morph. Um, and then you see the image. It feels like the image is physically located in your head. Like right now, I can see you all on my screen, your 2D, but still you appear to me as if you're like two feet away from my eyes on this screen. Whereas when there's rivalry, it physically feels like the image is inside your head. Um, which is how seeing always works, of course, uh, but, but we forget that. Um, so, of course, seeing this content on the screen is absolutely nothing like it being in VR. Um, so, yeah, it's 10 minutes, lots of different modes. I hope to release it someday for one of the VR stores, but, but we'll see. Um, so I'd like to talk about my most recent work, and this is the last project I'm going to talk about. Uh, today, this came out last year, Distributed Consciousness. It's essentially an NFT collection, um, but it's, uh, it's really a multifaceted work that spans themes of AI, distributed computation, distributed cognition, phenomenology, steganography, climate change, um, ecological awareness, and activism, and cephalopods. Um, so as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's an NFT collection and it, there's 256 of these things. Uh, that's two to the power of eight uh, because octopuses have eight legs. So I'll briefly talk what the project is and how it manifested itself. And then I'll talk about the themes behind the work. So yeah, these are some of the images. These are all AI generated, um, again, using clip guided VQGAN. And actually, there's two NFT collections. So there's two collections. Everything that I showed is actually from the first collection. There's 256, what I call tentacular critters. Um, and so there were two phases to this project. And I think of it as a kind of the release of it as a two part performance that took place on Twitter. So the first phase was the release of these 256 tentacular critters. Um, from 16th of October to 31st of October on this Twitter account um, using a custom smart contract. So every day for 16 days, 16 tentacular critters were spawned, as in put out to the wild. Um, there's lots of commotion on Twitter, which I wasn't expecting, but um, so that was very interesting, seeing the psychology of, you know, people wanting to get into collect collections. But then a month later, on 16th of November, the second phase began as I revealed the secret on the Twitter account. Um, so every one of the 256 images that was spawned had in fact some text cryptographically encoded in it, a verse hidden amongst the pixels, invisible to the human eye, but readable by code. So the entire collection of images is in fact a poem a book, a manifesto, and every octopus image is in fact one verse from the poem. 
Furthermore, the entire text was also generated with AI uh, using GPT-3. And so the manifesto is a human machine co-creation meditation. And it spans topics of free will, consciousness, life, death, art, technology, ritual, ecology, economy, and sustainability. And as part of the secret re reveal, uh, each verse was also released over the course of the following weeks as audiovisual readings. So you can see all of these um, on the website distributedconsciousness.xyz slash gallery. I was hoping to play some, but I think I'm going to run out of time, so I won't. Um, on the left, you can see the images. On the right, you can see um, the text. And this is like an audio video reading of it. It's about an hour and a half long. Um, it starts out very pseudo philosophy, kind of like typical AI generated stuff. But towards the end, it gets, I, it blew my mind. It gets quite profound um, and it is all AI generated. So I won't play any because I don't think I have time. I'll quickly try to sum up some of the motivations behind it. So there's a few threads that led to this. The first is the spark. So I'd been living in a small Mediterranean fishing village for the last few years, and I'd go snorkeling a lot. And when I go snorkeling, I see octopuses a lot. And they'd usually be at depths around five meters. And at that depth, water filters away a lot of color. So they'd always appear bluish green. But one day I saw one on a rock just a few centimeters from the surface under a full spectrum of sunlight. And it flashed at me the most intense colors and totally blew my mind. And that was the spark. And in fact, I tweeted it at the time. So the second thread relates to the blockchain. There's a lot to be said about the current developments around the so-called Web3 phenomena, whether it's VC-backed hyper-capitalist extreme libertarian values that drive its growth, or the ecological nightmare that is proof-of-work blockchain, such as Ethereum. But the point I'd like to focus on right now is a more philosophical and esoteric one. Um, I've been working within the field that we call AI for many years. And in kind of recent years, it exploded in popularity. This is the Google News trend graph for the term AI. And you can see that it kind of exploded in 2015. And this is a trend graph for the term big data. And you can see that it didn't exist till about 2011. And I'm really fascinated by how after a steady period of big data, we get AI. And I like the provocation that consciousness is evolution solution to dealing with big data in the natural world. Um, I'll skip a few slides regarding this because I think I don't have time, but I wrote a blog post about this in 2014. Um, and Peter Godfrey Smith's book, which I'm going to mention, actually completely unpacks this idea. But the basic premise is that as vision evolved, you know, half a billion years ago, animals started to become much smarter. And we started being able to form social interactions and regulating each other's nervous systems. And we started modeling not only the environment, but we started modeling each other as individuals and even started modeling ourselves as agents in this world, modeling the world and other individuals. So I really find it fascinating that the emergence of big data is analogous to the Darwinian evolution of intelligence and perhaps even consciousness. Um, but now continuing this thread, I find the rise of blockchain-based distributed world computers fascinating. Blockchains with smart contract support, such as Ethereum or Tezos, which allow the execution of arbitrary code in a distributed manner, where every node has a full copy of the code and data, and every node can operate autonomously if need be but they can also coordinate and reach consensus with other nodes in a distributed manner. So I find this fascinating as a metaphor relating to the rise of multicellular organisms in biology, where every cell in the body is, is itself an autonomous machine, also containing a full copy of the genetic code. And a body is a distributed network of such cells reaching consensus in a distributed manner. The third thread relates to what remarkable creature cephalopods are. Um, again, I'll try to keep this very brief, but 
Octopuses are not only incredibly intelligent, their intelligence is their nervous system. Everything about them is so radically different. Um, they do have a brain, but the brain only has 10% of their neurons. The rest is in the rest of their body, particularly in their arms. And their arms are autonomous. Their arms, even when severed from the body, can, can hunt, find food and behave and taste and smell. The arms can communicate with each other without involving the central brain. So the octopus has a very distributed intelligence. To paraphrase the philosopher Thomas Nagel, what is it like to be an octopus? The fourth thread relates again to the rise of AI um, and how this has forced us to think about other kinds of intelligences. Here's that Google News trend graph again for the term AI. Again, if you remember, it exploded in 2015. And in 2016, we had three books that came out about octopuses. And of course, none of these books, they're all brilliant books, but none of them are really about cephalopods. Instead, they all invite us to reflect on the nature of our relationship with non-human intelligences and consciousnesses that we share our planet with. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a few um, quotes, but I'll just leave them up. So if uh, it is recorded, you can, uh, you can read them. These are excerpts from the books that were quite relevant. And finally, distributed consciousness. Uh, much simpler with the gift of hindsight, we can see how the dangerous dichotomy of man versus nature, uh, I'm using gendered language here deliberately, has allowed man to justify his subjugation, or at least attempts of, of nature. And today we're experiencing the devastating consequences of this manufactured divide as we face mass extinctions, global warming and ecological collapse. So let us meditate on the interconnectedness of all human, non-human, living and non-living things across manifold scales of time and space. Let us meditate on the awe-inspiring beauty of the universe with all its complexity and simplicity that gave rise to the different kinds of minds able to meditate back on the awe-inspiring beauty of the universe with all its complexity and simplicity. Let us depart with despair and apathy in times of ecological collapse and urgency, and instead actively work towards multi-species flourishing, abandoning blind faith in gods, both the old overseers and the new techno fixers. Let us make kin and stay with the trouble. And that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for your time. I think I went a little bit over, apologies for that, but um, I'd love to take questions if you have any. so much for an incredibly engaging talk. I'm going to hand the microphone over to Courtney, who's going to mediate um, the session. Questions? Um, have you heard of the website thiscatdoesnotexist.com? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, of course. Yeah, this cat does not exist. This person does not exist. Did you have a follow-up question or? <laughs> okay. Yes. They use um, something called GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, which, yeah, I've been using as well. It's quite incredible how realistic um, images can be. The, the most recent thing that's come out was something called DALI, DALI 2, uh, which came out this week, uh, which is an extension of what I was using, which is text to image. And basically, you can just type in something like an astronaut riding a unicorn in space with rainbows surrounding the planets, and it just generates that image just from that text prompt. And it's uncanny. It's a really, really crazy future awaiting us. Was there any um, certain narratives or stories that inspired this? Um course of work for you? Um, anyone in particular or? 
yeah, any like in your childhood or maybe a prior to kind of deep diving into this whole AI um, driven work. Is there any stories or narratives that inspired you to do this? Yeah, if, if you're asking about like kind of personal stories, I can actually relate to something um, which like goes very, very back to my very early childhood, if, if that's kind of what you're asking. And that is my first experience of music um, was a music box and I still have it. And um, like this is back when I was a toddler and it's a music box. So, you, you know, you turn the thing and it makes uh, makes music. And I was in love with this thing. It played the Godfather. And in fact, that's probably the, you know, I used to play piano and I forgot, but the only thing I can still play on piano is the Godfather theme. So, but the thing with this that I remember throughout my whole growing up was you turn this and you make music and you can control the speed. And so I, I trace the roots of my fascination with real-time continuous meaningful human control to this music box because I could make music with that it sounded good and I was kind of in control um so I think I think that's a personal story which you know one could psychoanalyze my interests back to that point yeah thank you so much for in the meantime, while you guys are thinking, I have a story to share about how, about a connection that Nono, so I don't know if you saw Nono, but Anne McNamara is here in the audience, and I believe that we were all on the jury, or you might have been the chair of the jury, so I met, I met Memo at the Unified Jury for SIGGRAPH, and maybe 10 years ago, was it? It was a while, yeah. um, but most recently, I guess it was only right before the pandemic, um, Memo's logo, the little the icon that he has, his face. Um, when I was in France, a friend, <laughs> a friend that I was making, I think, had this sticker on her phone. <laughs> this was Hannah, and so I didn't know. We, I had met, I had met this person, and she had the sticker, and I was like, "Oh, that's Memo. I know Memo." So you have this like amazing, distinct brand that I love, and I think it's good. It's a good like takeaway as an artist to say like having having this recognizable. Um, it helps make connections. It helps people connect. And so I want to thank you for helping me making connections. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's an amazing story. So actually, um, so I have it on everything, and um, this actually emerged from a quick story about this is because we all have the same devices. And because I do a lot of installation and performance work, like I've lost so many MacBook charges that I just started putting them on everything that I own. I put them on everything that I own so that other people can say, oh, Memo, you forgot your, your charger, you forgot your phone, you forgot this table, uh, your MIDI controller. I mean, you know, right here, I have a MIDI controller again with, um, with it on so that other people can help me remember to pack my stuff basically so um it wasn't an exercise in branding but it became that i think it's brilliant <laughs> other questions i think this just gave me a little I love the connections that you make and the way that you tell stories through your work it was really fascinating to hear your process and your thought process behind it i know they're we're processing all of your questions <laughs> anybody want to ask one you want to ask? Okay, we have another question. Uh, I want to ask about the, uh, the the VR installation, and you were talking about how the, the um, how visually you reconcile the image so that it seems to be generating things inside your head. And I wondered if you combined this technology with binaural recording, you know, where it's mixed, um, those sound effects also um, work in your head. I would, I'd be fascinated to experience both simultaneously because I've seen them independently, but I haven't yet seen an artist who's working both of, with both of them at the same time. Yeah, that's, that's a very good, very good question. So the installation does use binaural audio, um, but it doesn't, um, so it doesn't necessarily prod the our um perception of how we 
you know, experience that. So there is binaural audio in the sense that when things are happening in, in the VR world, there are sound sources and that sound source is um, spatialized using binaural um, audio. And so you hear it to be in that space, but that's still reinforcing the realism of that sound source. So when I, for example, said that this VR piece is very non-VR, what I meant was it's using VR technology, but it's while VR is generally people try to create realistic experiences. So they try to um, amplify or leverage how we make sense of stereo vision. I was doing the opposite. I was trying to break down how we make sense of stereo vision. So I do use binaural audio, but not in a way to break down how we hear, but rather um, use it in, in, the, in the normal, quote unquote, normal way. Um, it's definitely something I'd also love to play with. Hearing perception is so radically different from seeing. Um, like we can hear two different sounds in two ears and we can hear them simultaneously and we can, we can consciously shift our attention to one versus the other. But with vision, we can't do that. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a whole research area in itself, I guess. Maybe we have time for one or two more questions. <laughs> Do you have a minute more? It's two o'clock. I know just to be conscious of your time. Are you okay to answer a couple more questions? Oh, me? Yeah, I am. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so a lot of this might be a little simple, but I was wondering about the VR when you uh, change what was in each eye. Was that something that gives you like Okay, so that was a bit quiet, but I think the question was about the VR and whether it gives like a, a sickness or things like was that was that correct? Yes, yeah, so you know people often get sick of VR, so I just wanted to say. Yeah, that's that's a very good question. So I did a lot of research, um, and by research I mean on myself. Uh, I spent months, you know, developing that piece. So the generally the um, what makes people sick in VR generally is motion sickness. It's when you're moving in the virtual world, and that contradicts with what the signal. The, you know, your eyes are telling you you're moving through the world, but everything else in your body is telling you that you're not moving in the world, um, and that's generally what causes sickness, um, or nausea rather. So in this, I made there is only one place where there is movement. And I made that super slow, like insanely slow. So there is no nausea. I mean, even people who, um, like I had a friend who said, like, she can't do any VR. It makes her instantly sick. She was fine with it. So I tested it out like that. However, um, it's a whole different kind of, not nausea, but weirdness that you experience. Um, the final version of it, is tuned to not make people uncomfortable. Um, it is still uncomfortable. The first time it happens, like I have videos of people swearing like crazy, like what the God? Because it's really something you've never experienced. In my early tests, before it was tuned, um, it was physically painful. Like there were moments where you're in a room, let's say, and the room rotates in opposite directions. And your eyes lock on to, to the room. So in the early versions, like the room's rotating quite quickly, it physically feels like someone reaches into your eye sockets, grabs your eyes and then yanks them. Um, so like for the first couple of weeks, I was just, my vision was quite, quite destroyed. The current version, like the final version, everything's very slow. So um, it's not painful. It's just really, really weird. Um, so I had a question about, uh, I, can, I can be louder, is this better? Oh, that's, that's very good, yeah, thanks. Okay, um, so you found yourself in a very uh, specific realm of generative art, and I was curious about how you kind of found your way there in terms of uh, your, your starting point academically and then going to where you are now, uh, just because your work incorporates so many different types 
fields of artistic endeavors? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I'm not an academic, really. Uh, I do have a position now at UCSD, um, which is very, very recent. I do have a PhD, but this is all actually quite recent. I My undergrad was civil engineering in Turkey. It's not something I wanted to do. Uh, it's just the education system in Turkey. I was good at math, so it's like people will always need buildings. You become a civil engineer. So in a way, I'm not academic at all. I hated university. I couldn't wait to get out. Um, I barely finished and I, I fled the country as soon as I finished and I moved to England. My, I would say I'm very research driven. Um, I used to call it messing about. In fact, I used to call it other things that I, I won't say now, but like messing about is what I used to call what I did. Um, and only after many decades of doing this, when I started seeing a lot of my friends and peers and colleagues are actually academics, that's when I started realizing, actually, maybe I was traumatized my own academic experience at university. Uh, maybe academia isn't so bad. Let me try it out. So I did a PhD. I loved it. I really, really loved doing a PhD. And then I thought, OK, maybe I should yeah, give academia a second chance. Um, but I would say that it's very research-based, my work. It, it's fundamentally research uh, more than, I used to call it generative art. I don't so much anymore because generative art has kind of become something else now, um, which is less research-based. It, it's more um, like the generative art of today is basically the aesthetics of a hundred years ago, just made with code. Um, and I'm more interested in, I wonder what happens when you do this kind of thing. So I hope that answers your question. Does it? Yes, thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> thank you, fellow. I, we want to thank you very, very much for spending this time with us and concluding our, our year long speaker series. Um, it's been wonderful to have you. And, uh, thank you, everyone. Round of applause.